understanding the situation. It is indeed the whole social context which believes that more and more to deal with the problems of health and disease in society, to deal with explaining who we are and why we are what we are, then you need to look inside us. You need to look first at our brains, then at our cells, then at our genes, then at particular molecules, then at particular atoms that have been that are perhaps disorganized. That is the wrong way of looking at things. We have to understand the need to create a coherent and integrated science which puts genetics and puts evolution in their place as profoundly important in understanding who and what we are, but at the same time, a place which accepts their role, but also accepts the overwhelming role of the social context in which we live. So, what I want to end up with is to insist that we need to look towards a different sort of science, we need to look towards an integrated science. We need to look towards a science which recognizes that we create ourselves as individuals. I come back to this again. Out of the raw material of our genes, our environment, our society. And that means that we are also biologically, just as much as we are socially, free to create our own futures. We create our own futures out of this raw material, and out of the societies in which we live. And this is the perspective on, on a biosocial science, which I think should replace the insistence on genetic determinism, the insistence on genetic Prometheanism, and also should find a way of looking forward to how we can genuinely create a science which could be in the service of, if not the transformation of humanity from its present dismal state, at least a chance, a possibility of saving ourselves and our planet from the destruction which I think is very close at hand. Thank you very much. Okay, that's fine. Let me just do a, a, couple, of, a, a couple of the pol more political questions that came up first of all. Certainly, firstly, Kashif on Afghanistan. Um, <laughs> the issue is, I think, sort of probably the incapacity of those people, of, of those people like Blair um, and, and, and now Brown and Bush to actually recognize that those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Anyone who knows the history of the involvement of the Brits and, for that matter, the Russians in Afghanistan in the 19th century and that great game they were playing would actually recognize that what's going on in Afghanistan now is, is, is a disaster and a folly. But I wanted to go immediately from that to Richard Dawkins. Um, and the reason for that is that anyone who calls George W. Bush a shitty little oil shake can't be all bad, can he? And Richard did that. But, but, but furthermore, although I'm not sure he'd wish it to be publicly known at the moment, Richard was one of the people who signed up very early on when a few of us called for a moratorium on research collaboration with Israel until they signed up for just peace for the Palestinians. He might want to back off from it now, but that was his position then, and he deserves credit for it. But he is, despite all that, despite all that, as Pete said, he's a mechanical materialist. And you become a mechanical materialist, and then you find yourself in trouble at the end of it, uh, when, as at the back end of the selfish gene, he says, only we can um, escape from the tyranny of our selfish genes. So who's this we, white boy? I mean, what's going on here? <laughs> Either we are the products of our genes, or we are not. If we are the products of our genes, our genes which enable us to escape from them. And that's what, how, in a, in a peculiar way, a lot of the people who are evolutionary psychologists or are or, or, or genetic determinists become a, a mechanical materialist, end up as straightforward dualists, even though they don't recognize that they are. And the problem that we have to do is to explain to them, this comes back to the whole issue, of, which was raised in, on a number of occasions, of, of, of free will and determinism. Um, the whole free will debate actually falls out of a peculiar tradition in Western um, philosophy of science, I think, and, and, and in fact, sort of the Judeo-Christian tradition. It's a real problem for us because we have to think in these dichotomizing categories. Either we are determined or we are free. I think that the issue about free will is a confusion of categories. As Radha said, earlier on, and several others, I think it was Martin who also pointed out, things feed back on themselves. We are, of course, 
the products of our genes and our evolutionary history. But because of our genes and our evolutionary history, we actually create new sorts of societies and new sorts of environments, and these feedback and transformed as well. This is not an interactive process, it's a dialectical process. It's a dialectical process whose outcome is radically indeterminate. And it's precisely because we live at the interface of these multiple determinisms that actually so the, 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 that we are free in this sort of way. But the freedom also means that we need to decide what are the determining factors in any particular circumstance. If we want to know the cause of the Iraq war, it's no good looking for the levels of serotonin receptors in George W.'s brain. You do have to look at politics. If you actually want to know the causes of Alzheimer's disease, you do need to look at some of the biochemistry that goes wrong in the brains of people who are suffering from Alzheimer's disease. You can then look at the causes for those bits of biochemistry going wrong, and you can find that there are certain genetic risk factors, just as there are environmental risk factors. But you actually do have to see which in any circumstances are the determining cause, and that is one of the crucial lessons for transforming and getting ourselves out of the morass of thinking in these very reductionist and molecular sorts of ways. That leads me to the set of questions that were about, um, were, were um, concerning um, psychiatric illness of one sort or another. Bipolar disorder, for example, and the relationship between genes and bipolar. When you've been around for as long as I have in, 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 in this sort of terrain, you see the fashionable molecule and the fashionable gene of the moment coming and going over the course of the last 20 or 30 years, whether it's schizophrenia or bipolar or whatever. The truth of the matter seems to be, firstly, that diagnosis changes, that people who are called schizophrenic at one moment are called bipolar at another because diagnosis changes according to fashionable criteria. And indeed, not just fashionable criteria, but the drugs which are potentially available from the big companies to advertise to treat that particular condition rather than another particular condition. And also, um, that any of the claims to have identified a gene associated with schizophrenia or with bipolar, which ought to have been more straightforward, have actually come and gone and fallen by the wayside. And I think we need to go back to recognizing the frailty of those diagnoses and the fact that they have to be seen once again in the social context. What I can never forget, and I insist on arguing in the context of things like schizophrenia and bipolar and so on, is who is most likely in Britain to be diagnosed as schizophrenic today? Okay, the answer is very clear. Working class rather than middle class, black kids rather than white kids. Who is more likely to be diagnosed as depressed in Britain today? Um, and the answer is women by two and a half times more than men. What are the risk factors for being diagnosed as depressed? Is it if you're a woman living in a high-rise block in Camberwell in conditions of economic insecurity and an unstable relationship and, as, and a child? Um, so do we want to look at biochemistry or do we really want to look at the social context in order to try to, so, in, in order to, try to resolve those questions? The molecular insistence on looking internally, I think, falls by the wayside in this particular context. Same again... <laughs> Same again, coming right back to, to, to Jeff's and other people's comments right at the beginning of our, about IQ. Before we get too stuck on IQ tests, I want to remind you of another story. In the 1930s, um, when kids began to be tested for IQ, it turned out that one sex scored better on the IQ test than the other. This was deemed inappropriate. And the tests were adjusted so that both sexes scored on average um, equally. Which sex do you think, or do I not need to ask you, scored better on the IQ test? All right. So, so the tests are essentially a social construct. Um, they're a social construct which have value. Um, and indeed, um, I think that, um, that, that people have pointed out that they do in fact have value, that Simon pointed out they can be used for forensic purposes. But do not get stuck in the belief 